it's pretty clear that I've never been all that popular, and if you'd ever seen me dance, you'd know that I'm also not very cool. To me, popularity is confusing. Coolness is confusing. Because what's popular if not just what people like, and what's coolness if not what those same people don't like? Or maybe even more so, what other people like? Cool people. And how do you sustain coolness once you're popular? I mean, look at Johnny Depp. Actually, don't. You'll just encourage him. Instead, let's look at two of Chile's most famous cities. Because one of them is popular, but the other? It's cool. In Chile, if you ask people to name a lifeless, soulless, poor example of the country's culture, chances are they'll tell you about Viña del Mar. No charm, they'd say. It's a city that's best defined by its pop music festival, sanitized beaches, and near-identical rows of modern condos. No great cuisine will be found in Viña because no great chef would set up somewhere so dedicated to blandness. It's one of the first places in the country to build a casino, and since then has been dedicated primarily to indifferent tourism. The type of place you'd go to relax, not to experience. Even though the president has a vacation home here, and every summer it seems like the entire city of Santiago floods into the town to enjoy a few days by the beach, if you ask local Chileans where you should go as a tourist, chances are nobody is going to recommend you go to Viña. If anything, they'd probably tell you about its neighbor, Valparaiso. Virtually every tourist in Chile ends up spending at least some time in Valpo. It's everything that Viña isn't. It's gritty, it's unique, it offers something interesting beyond that which you can consume. But the crime is also higher, its buildings are somewhat dilapidated, and everything just seems generally less well-managed. It's the sort of place we'd call bohemian. Because of this, unlike Vina, it draws in a more foreign crowd. People looking for an experience to bring home with them, something a little more edgy than relaxing. I think tourism here would be best personified by an Instagram photo of a person pretending not to be posing next to graffiti when they were so clearly posing next to graffiti. It's the sort of place an artist would live so you knew they were serious about their art. For lack of a better word, it's cool. In Valparaiso, the tourist sites tend to lean towards the cultural artifacts of an artistic society. It's the city of Pablo Neruda, protected as a UNESCO World Heritage Site and containing a cemetery for exiled political dissidents. Well-made graffiti lines the waterfront hillsides, and distinct historical architecture looms over the port. It's a place to visit art galleries and witness some of Chile's underground realities, a place to have a more authentic experience than what you'd get from a street that might as well have been pulled out of any first world resort town. And yet, if you look at where people visit, it's clear that Viña del Mar is by far the more popular city. It's where people flock. It's where the money goes. Investment is without a doubt more heavily weighted towards the towers and avenues of Vina than the small houses and winding lanes of Valpo. Even for the tourists who are looking to see Valparaiso, most of them spend the night in Vina and head over during the day. Because Vina is clean, Vina is safe, and Vina is sanitized. It's the pop music of cities. Valparaiso may be recommended by Chileans, but it always comes with a caveat. Don't stray too far from the path, they'll say. Don't go too deep into neighborhoods. Stick to the downtown core. Because for everything else that Valpo offers, it's generally unsafe. It's almost as if to sustain that feeling of coolness, it also has to sustain that sharp edge. The two go hand in hand. There's little about Valparaiso that's sanitized, and for the most part, that's what the tourists are there to see. But only for a visit. Once the lights go out, most pack into the clean, secure public transit that connects the two cities and head back to their safe condo complex in Vina, just far enough away from the town they came to see to feel comfortable again. Perhaps a good way to explain what I mean is by looking at the Beatles. They're arguably among the most famous bands to ever exist, and came about during a time when popular counterculture was only just starting to take off in the West. They straddled both sides of popular and cool, and in doing so they set up a pattern we see repeated right through to the modern day. In their beginning, the Beatles were Viña del Mar. Safe, sanitized pop meant for people who listened to music that was essentially harmless. Their audiences were primarily young women and their lyrics were focused on love, similar to an early Justin Bieber. But as time went on, the Beatles changed. Even though it feels tame by present day standards, their music gained an edge. As their sound began to reflect their increasing drug use, their fandom followed suit. Love turned to raccoons, help turned to submarines, and teen girls turned to 20-something men. As time went on, they lost the squeaky clean image of the generic pop music of their past, and they started becoming cool. 
But the point is that neither truly upended the other. By straddling the line between the two concepts, they likely became bigger than either would allow on their own. Their new music was counterculture, but still built on the back of their early, somewhat sanitized popularity. In other terms, they began to offer their fans a view of Valparaiso, but with the ability to still feel like they could retreat to the safety of Vina. Justin Bieber may have started breaking the law and covered himself in tattoos, but deep down his fans can still see him as that boy who sang Baby. Miley Cyrus may have came in like a wrecking ball, but only once her fans were comfortable with her as Hannah Montana. To me, it seems like at its core, something almost has to defy what's popular to be cool, or perhaps even more so, it has to defy what's clean. For something to be cool, somehow, in some way, it has to feel unsafe. It has to come with some form of risk attached. But that doesn't mean it will be any less famous, beloved, or well-received, just that it goes against the expectation of survival-focused beings. But even that comes with a limit. Popular things are popular for a reason, and they always will be. The easy, safe solution, despite not being cool, is definitely what the average version of us wants. For the most part, we want to visit danger, not live in it, especially during the biologically dangerous early and late stages of life. The city of Valparaiso is better serviced for having Viña del Mar next to it, and vice versa, because together they can offer pop coolness to their tourists without the feeling of inconsistency that having both in a single city might impose. If the hipsters are to be believed, Coolness and popularity are at odds with one another. But as I see it, they're intricately linked. They're just two sides of the same coin. Because what is coolness if not popularity with a whiff of danger, with a whiff of indifference? But there is a limit there. We all know that a place where you might get stabbed is cooler than one where you won't, but nobody really wants to get stabbed. Valpo may have better art, architecture, culture, and ratings on TripAdvisor.com, but at the end of the day, most people find themselves back in safe, reliable, sanitized Venia. Because love it or hate it, pop music is here to stay. This is Rare Earth. Justin Bieber, send me your monkey. I know they won't let you have it. I want your monkey. He could be my butler. We'd be best friends. Send me your monkey.